very happy to be here and explain some of the work we are doing on cellular imaging in the Institute for Cell Engineering. And a lot of the work that we are doing is related to um, the clinical <coughs> guidance and monitoring of stem cell therapy. Um, not only stem cell therapy, but we're engineering general methods that can also be used for cancer vaccine development, dendritic cell therapy, island cell transplantation. <clears throat> but this work originally was stimulated about 15 years ago by the emergence of stem cell therapies. Um, we focus a lot on diseases in the brain and in the spinal cord, and um, there's just an example of one uh, clinical um, a trial that has been done or studies that are being planned on sort of stem cells. And the, um, the key thing that we are looking at is, is two things. A, um, are the cells injected at the right place? And also B, what happens with the cells? So currently there are surrogate markers we can uh, work with, dopamine analogs that we can label uh, really actively and we can look at the um, functional binding but we don't really know uh, what happens to the cells. And <clears throat> a lot of our knowledge <clears throat> is based on um, histology, microscopy, um, we sacrifice animals, we take out tissue. Um, even the, um, the GERM trial, there were um, discussions with the FDA, how many biopsies do you need to take from the spinal cord to get an overview. So the goal um, of, of my group is to develop non-invasive whole body cell tracking techniques. The first and foremost question, which I will show is not always trivial, is are stem cells being delivered, injected correctly? Often this is done under imaging guidance. And also how many cells have been correctly delivered if we inject it from a remote site? Now the, what we use is so-called, we use different methods of, of labeling cells or looking at cells, but one of the um, main players is a magnetic dye that is a magnetic particle that is about the size of a virus. It acts as a very little magnet. Um, it disturbs the magnetic field in an MRI scanner. So this is the magnetic field, normally 1.5 or 3 Tesla. Normally the protons, the water molecules that we image, the protons have a spin, is called neatly aligned. Um, they are disturbed and that leads to a loss of imaging signal. They're called superparamagnetic iron oxide lux. It sounds like a commercial term, but it has a physical meaning. And there are many types out there. As an example, um, a lot of the pigments um, traditionally uh, made from clays and things have iron in there as a pigment. And you can see here <coughs> on the eyelid here, where the makeup is on both eyes, you can see how the protons get the face and you lose that imaging signal. So where our cells are located, the cells are hyper-intense. I will show you four examples of cell delivery to the brain uh, where we track cells. The first one um, is an intraparenchymal injection, such as is done, for instance, in the case of uh, Parkinson's disease. Then I will show a uh, clinical study in a, in a child uh, using intraventricular ejection, um, intravenous injection in MS and ALS patients where bone marrow stem cells are injected. And finally, interarterial injections that are currently being uh, pursued clinically in stroke patients. So first, the interparenchymal injection. So here's a an, uh, an, uh, mouse brain where we have uh, labeled ourselves, remember they appear dark, and we can image process the, um, the images, and we can do 3D reconstructions, and we can slice the brain up and not miss a single slice. So with microscopy, and Christ has a tremendous amount of work to, uh, to look at that and just saw where the cells are. Now when we do a 3D reconstruction of that, um, which um, you saw by Dr. Um, Goyang this morning, um, who, who showed the neural stem cell and the projections using reconstruction with microscopy, we can see how an immortalized neural stem cell line that remains growing has these finger-like projections, how it grows into the brain. Intraventricular injection. So this was an, uh, <clears throat> a neonatal uh, study where the um, anesthesia went wrong and the child was uh, cut off um, of oxygen for a while and um, is in a vegetative state. And the idea is, for instance, for MS to inject the cells in the CF, CS7 in the ventricles that you get a global um, distribution of the cells throughout the neural axis. 
And uh, we, we looked at that, and um, what we have here is false color segmentation that facilitates looking at it. So what is black with the computer, we can make it red, and you can see that it stays in one horn. And the CSF flow is not enough to distribute that. So as it turned out, the cells just sediment, and the patient is in a vegetative state. So these kind of things are important to, um, to look at if you want to get whole distribution. You would have to move the patients around and... Uh, we're currently having some ideas to use magnets to pull the cells to the location. Interarterial um, is done clinically in stroke. So you can see here one hemisphere, how the cells um, lodge there. And what's important is the safety of these kind of studies. It depends on the cell size. So if you inject small cells, glial restrict precursor cells, we see them entering um, the brain but they, um, they will flow through. This is a normal brain where you can see that. Where we have large cells such as mesenchymal stem cells, we can see <coughs> how they, um, they um, um, localize the certain vessels and stay there for a prolonged time. So we have to do that very carefully um, because we can cause microemboli. We have um, compared the, uh, lab the distribution of cells um, with a perfusion agent. So this, this looks like an octopus, but it actually it's the brain. These are the eyeballs of a dog. Here we have a perfusion agent where you see three flashes. Um, it clears out of the brain of another contrast agent. And you see here on the right the, um, the iron oxide labeled cells um, accumulating in that area. <clears throat> what we can do, we can uh, do an overlay where we look at the perfusion and we can um, look at the, um, the iron oxide accumulation and we can actually do the perfusion afterwards so we can see if the cerebral blood flow is, um, is, is um, unimpaired, does not get blocked by the cells. So this is in a rat what I want to show you, um, a clinical scenario that may happen. Um, where we do not exactly know um, if our cells arrive at the target. So we inject that labeled mesenchymal stem cell in a common corroded artery. And you can see that here. And what happened is, you see the cells ended up here, in, the, um, in part of the muscle never in the brain. And there was an artery that I personally had never heard of, the pterygoid palatine artery, and that needed to be clamped off, and then we got a, a good distribution in the brain. So this. Um, shows how the, the imaging, the guided delivery is very important to see um, where we um, inject our cells. On the previous scenario, in the old days, we would have taken out the brain, we would have sliced it up using microscopy, and we would have concluded that our cells either flow through the brain and they leave, or they never um, cut there and somehow don't bind. Now we have been working uh, with transfected cells, so we put a docking molecule, um, uh, VLA4, that is normally used by lymphocytes to dock to inflamed endothelium. And um, so we target cells to inflamed areas, and then after about three days, the question is, of these cells can extravasate? And the um, answer is yes. When you look at the, um, the green is the vessels, and the red are all labeled cells. They also have rhodium in. You can see here how there is um, a different localization of that. Okay, um, then next. These are um, the number of clinical trials that have been pursued using these iron oxides. They have all been performed outside of the United States. And one of the issues is that the material that has been used, the patent expired, it's, it's used in an off-label application and is no longer made. So they're now, uh, we're waiting for new materials to arrive. This was the first clinical study. I want to show this as an example, not with stem cells, but with a cancer vaccine. So the dritic cells are labeled. This was done in combination with my group at the University of Nijmegen in the Netherlands. So the first patient was injected ever with these labeled cells in 2004. This is a lymph node of a stage 4 melanoma patients where the vaccine needs to be injected. And in half the patients, here are labeled cells, which ended up in the uh, subcutaneous fat. Uh, were not injected correctly. Apparently it's very difficult to put that needle in the lymph node. Once you're through the capsule, um, you have to stop before you know you puncture all the way through. So um, this was done under ultrasound guidance, not under MRI. And I will show an example in a little bit um, how we can inject cells under MRI. 
So they, when you use radionuclide traces, such as inumopsin, you cannot really see where the cells are injected because you don't have the anatomy. <clears throat> um, intravenous injection is a study um, uh, done in co collaboration with Hadassah University in Jerusalem with um, uh, Carusis and Tamir ben Khur. So the idea is that mesenchymal stem cells, they have um, um, uh, inflammatory suppressive properties, and that's one of the, the many uses of MSCs um, currently, and the idea is in MS, which is a neuroinflammatory disease, that after um, injection you see a decrease of neuroinflammation. So the question is, and this is um, done intravenously, they're autologous, uh, bone marrow, stromal bone marrow stem cell derived mesenchymal cell cells, stem cells, and you can see here near the occipital horns, you see here these dark intensities that are not there before and the cells co-localize with the inflammation. That leads to another um, spin-off thing, not only um, do the therapeutic cells get to the area where they need to um, do therapy, but it's currently believed that cells are attracted by inflammation, for instance myocardial infarct, the inflammation itself is actually a beneficial thing to recruit bone marrow stem cells for healing and of course, after things are healed, the um, inflammation needs to be uh, turned down and it's believed that mesenchymal stem cells have an innate mechanism to help doing that. Now for um, FDA approval, the only cell tracker that is approved is indiamoxin. Um, originally it was used for imaging of occult infection with autologous blood cells. This is an example for systemic administration where you can do hotspot imaging um, study done with Derek Kreitman with MSCs in a canine myocardial infarct model. So on day one, a lot of these cells end up in the lung, and you have to be very careful with doing these studies that you um, inject slowly and, and uh, safely, that you don't cause pulmonary embolisms. Day two, you can see them homing to the heart, and that uh, is persistent over about day five, and that gives some beneficial effect. Now, with MRI, we can, as we mentioned, see our cells. Um, we can see if they're injected correctly in the area of myocardial infarct. And I think our um, next speaker from Hopkins is going to talk about um, cardiac stem cell therapy. Um, when do, we do this on the fluoroscopy, uh, not all injections are successful. So we can inject cells in the MRI scanner with a special catheter. So here's the um, infarct that we can um, visualize on MRI with another contrast agent. And then the idea is to put the cells very precisely uh, near the um, borderline of the infarct, and we can do that in real time uh, with MRI where we can see the cells deposited. So this is about, um, give or take, or eight years ago. We have now special um, interventional um, suites where we can image the heart, shown here, and then we superimpose it on a CT. Um, the, the bed just goes from one to the other scanner, and for instance, if you want to ver do very difficult injections um, in the pericardial sac, where the idea is that you can have the, just like the ventricle, you have the sac, so the cells can um, reach large areas of the heart. Uh, by doing um, this technique, we can target the needle very carefully to the pericardial sac without hitting um, any vessels.